the story of the professor who dreamt he was lecturing and woke up to find that he was. <laughs> I hope you do better than that today. This is not a Norwegian sweater, this is an Icelandic sweater. I called Amazon and had it shipped in especially for this morning. I needed something from near the Arctic Circle. So, this part of a two-part uh, presentation we met to uh, meet last week. Uh, we were here, but nobody came. <laughs> That's why we have cross-country skis, right? I'm Phil Kwanbeck, and my wife is uh, Dr. Ruth Johnson. This is part of a two-part, I, I don't know for next week, uh, we don't know, there's a second, we've had to change things, but this is kind of a look at what it means to visit biblical sites, and the second part will be about contemporary issues in, for Christians in Palestine, Bethlehem in particular, where we have a strong Lutheran connection, and so this will lead into some of the contemporary issues that you hear about in the news as relates to the Holy Land and uh, Christians and our experience today. And we as a Lutheran church, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, have a very strong connection with Mitri Rahib and, and others in the Evangelical Church of the, of the Holy Land. So I'm going to talk about Promised Land from Moses to MLK, Martin Luther King, who was considered by many to be a modern American Moses. And Moses has been a really important figure for America. And we've often mapped the biblical story onto the American experience. But let me first ask, how many of you have been to Washington, D.C., either in, and visited the holy sites? <laughs> and I mean that in a good way. What are the holy sites in Washington, D.C.? The Washington, what else? The Lincoln Memorial, and where you have the second inaugural. I mean, are, are these important things? And, and, and uh, these relate to history. How many have been to the Library of Congress and or to uh, have seen the Declaration of Independence? Yeah. And, and so those are the sacred texts. And does going there give meaning, a new meaning to those texts? Likewise, Philadelphia. Who's been to uh, Constitution? Yeah. And, and you see the place and see the bell, right? It's kind of cracked. <laughs> We won't go into that metaphor today. But I, but I just want to say we, we use the Bible, we use holy places to give meaning to texts. Uh, or even Mount Rushmore. Who's been to Mount Rushmore? Isn't that odd? In the middle, in western South Dakota of all places. Uh, you know, you're on your way to the motorcycle rally and then you realize there's this, <laughs> this big thing. So, I'll advance here. First of all, a map. Remember your Bibles that you got in third grade that you had in confirmation, those little black NR, uh, RSVs with the maps inside and maybe pictures. Anybody, did you all get one? Did you look at the maps? No. Okay, thank you. We'll speak later. Um, most of my students today aren't acquainted with maps because they use ways. And, and ways won't get you to the promised land. It, it, it may get you to Target. Uh, but here we have a map. And, and what I want to emphasize is that the story begins here at Mount Nebo, which is on the east side of the, of the uh, Dead Sea and the Jordan River. And think of the ways in which the Jordan River has appeared in the imagination of American hymnody. And I, I use African American spirituals in my class to talk about the way that slaves took this story of the Exodus and freedom and transposed it into their story in the United States. One more river, there's one more river to cross. Remember that one? Jordan River. But what was the river? The Ohio. And so the Jordan becomes the Ohio, and freedom becomes the promised land. And so I want, to, want you to think about how texts shape our view of land and how land shapes our view of texts. Okay. What we're going to talk about today, I'm not that good at PowerPoint, but I'm going to just isolate a few places that appear in biblical stories. Mount Nebo, Bethlehem, notice that, that's, that's really cool. I 
did it up and down. <laughs> Jerusalem, the Galilee region, Caesarea Philippi, and Caesarea Maritima. And, and the text today, what Sunday is this today? Transfiguration Sunday? And if you ride on a bus, the, your guide will point, there's Mount Tabor, which is the name often given to the, the Mount of Transfiguration. That's the only time Moses makes it into the land of Israel. Are you aware of that? Moses is sitting there saying, I finally made it. <laughs> and Elijah, who's been there before, said, don't worry, you wouldn't want to have been here when I was here. <laughs> so think of the significance. If you know the mapping, this is where Moses ends his journey. But in the New Testament story we read today, he makes it here. If you know the map, the story takes on new significance. Moving along. Okay. This is the obligatory tourist photo. <laughs> there are people in this room who are also in this photo. Let's see, Bob and Joanne Shane, are they here? They're not, they didn't make it. Terry and Carl. Terry Rubbins and Carl Redding. Uh, Jane Callahan is there. Um, you can be in this photo in uh, May of 2020 when we go back again, leaving Memorial Day weekend. But what is the significance of this photo and reading the Bible? This is a standard tourist photo. It's taken from the top of what's called the Mount of Olives. Heard of that? And what do you see in the background over my smiling head? The Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock. And what is that? It's a mosque. It's, it, yeah, it's a mosque. It's a Muslim holy site that marks a place associated with uh, Muhammad. But it also approximates, we're not sure, where the ancient Jerusalem temple might have stood. We're not sure. But what, here's what struck me on my first visit to Israel in 2000. Standing on top of the Mount of Olives, you're looking, we're all, as we look this way, over the heads of that crew there. We're looking east. And what are we looking at? We're looking at what's called the Temple Mount. And it struck me that in the Gospels, this is the view that Jesus always has when he approaches Jerusalem. He is always coming behind you. If, 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 you're, if we're looking east here, behind us over the hill is a town called Bethany. Ring a bell? Mm -hmm. yes. Who lived in Bethany? Mary and Martha? Yeah. Lazarus? And Jesus stays there. He never seems to stay overnight in Jerusalem, but he always approaches over this hill. And in the year 38 uh, A.D. or C.E., what would he have seen on that hilltop? Where the, he would have seen the temple. And so this is what changed my reading of the Gospels, is that Jesus always approaches Jerusalem from the heading east, coming from the west, and he sees the temple. And what's the accusation that will be made at his trial in the Gospels? That he threatened to destroy the temple. And that he's a blasphemer. And what will he do in the temple according to the Gospels? Drive out the money changers. So the scene, as you start unpacking the scene, look behind these people, and what you have is a lot of the action that's critical to the last days of Jesus' life according to the Gospels, all four of them. And so, just you pause and take on this view. What else do you see as you look over? First of all, I, I also want to say, it makes a difference who you travel with. Travel with this group. They really make it a good experience. So, if we can line them up again. <laughs> what do you see here? Does that date back to the Roman era? No, that's pretty much 20, late 20th century. So what it tells you about what's happened to Jerusalem. Is it a museum? No, it's very much a lively place of commerce and religious conflict today. So we, we map on, the more we know about religion and the Bible and the Quran and Judaism and Christianity, the more we're going to understand what's going on in this picture. Can I move on? Any questions? Do you see where I'm going with this? Maybe not. So when we traveled, 
We, every morning we read Psalm 121, I lift my eyes to the hills from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. What are the hills to which this person is lifting up his or her eyes? Jerusalem. And what's in Jerusalem? The temple. And the, in the Bible, Jerusalem is always up. You always go up to Jerusalem, no matter where you are. And there are places in Jerusalem where you look down and where the temple stood, but you still go up to the temple. And the Hebrew word is to make your aliyah. And maybe you have Jewish friends who moved to Israel, and that's called making their aliyah, moving from here to a, a, a homeland. So what we have embedded in the Bible are all these stories of pilgrimages to the temple. Who, who goes to the temple? Jesus goes to the temple. Think of all the stories where Jesus, his family, and where does the Gospel of Luke end up after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus? At the temple. So notice we keep coming back. Moving right along. <clears throat> First of all, the walls we see in modern in Jerusalem today are not the walls of Jesus' day. The Jerusalem of Jesus' day is buried 22 feet underneath rubble. Why? Because in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. So this looks cool, but this is medieval Turkish wall construction. This is the eastern gate of the city of Jerusalem. What have they done to the doors here? They sealed it up. That's because... They took seriously uh, the biblical prophecy that the Messiah would return, and according to tradition, Jesus would land. Where did he take off from? The Mount of Olives in the Ascension? Where is he supposed to land when he comes back? The Mount of Olives. We've got to get you up on your apocalyptic Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> and so then he's going to march into the city, and so how do you keep Jesus from marching, the, uh, the return Jesus from marching into Jerusalem when he returns in heavenly glory? You seal the gate. <laughs> Just want you to know, there's a lot going on in what you see here. Oh, there is a webcam on the Mount of Olives, on the spot where Jesus took off. So if you want to spend your time watching for Jesus to return, you can. I'll give you the, the web address. So this is looking uh, from the west, looking east. And here again we have the Temple Mount. All of this was destroyed during the Roman period, so we're looking, the, the, the Jerusalem of Jesus is 22 feet now. And so you have to go through tunnels and excavations to see the land of Jesus. And this would be the Mount of Olives here. And the hillsides are lined with graves. Tombs, mostly Jewish tombs, some Muslim, some Christian. Why? Because they're waiting for Jesus for a resurrection. There's a lot going on. More, more walls. I'll move through this. A lot of rocks. Let's talk a little bit about this thing called the Temple Mount. Do you see this wall here? And going around, can you make that out? Yeah. And this would be the Dome of the Rock, the approximate place of uh, the... Uh, original temple, approximate, we don't know. Is there any archaeological evidence that there was a Jewish temple there? No. So where do we go to find that out? That's where we transpose the text onto this place. This is Al-Aqsa Mosque. So who controls this area here? The Palestinian Authority. And who controls the area around it? The State of Israel. So when you go from below to up, what are you going? You're going through political and religious boundaries. So this little piece of turf, who's it important for? Three religions. I'll keep moving on here. Okay, anybody know Latin? Hortus Gethsemane? Horticulture? Garden. Heard of it? Where's my students when they see it in English? Gethsemane? 
they, they, they never heard it before. But, but this is the Latin version. What's connected, where does that appear in the gospel stories? Is this an important part of the story? Yeah, this is in the valley below, as we looked east, uh, or looked east toward the temple, and you go down the hill, that's where the garden is. What's it associated with? Jesus' arrest. And thankfully, the Catholic Church has built a, t a church there, and the guide will tell you these are olive trees, and they're very old, and what will the guides tell you, do you think? They're about 2,000 years old. <laughs> Jesus leaned on this particular one, and then George Washington slept here. Uh, you know, that's where we're, we're walking the line of credibility when you say this is the place. But is it generally the idea? Yeah. So does it have to be, uh, does this prove the Bible true, or does this enhance your understanding of the text? I think it enhances your understanding of the text when you get to the garden and you realize this is a place that is near the city but not quite in it. More olive trees. Oh, another shot of that. Okay, let's talk about the wall. This is called the Wailing Wall. It's also called the Western Wall. Uh, this is not the wall of the second temple. The second temple was built by Herod the Great. That name ring a bell? And one thing you have to keep straight as you travel to these places, the, Bible, the New Testament mentions Herod, but they're two different ones. In the Gospel of Matthew, it's Herod the Great who dies in 4 BC, who is the threat to the infant Jesus. It's Herod Antipas, the son of Herod, who is the Herod of the crucifixion story. They're not the same Herod, just the same name. Um, and so this is not the temple, but what is it? It's the holiest place in Judaism today. This is the retaining wall. Herod was a builder and he expanded that temple. Remember I saw, you saw that great expanse of the Temple Mount? And so this is not in the Bible, but this is, would this have been there when Jesus was there? Yes. You see these big rocks? We would say that's Herodian. And so this takes us back to the first century. So when we're standing at this western wall, here we are at the first century. And the temple is gone, so what do Orthodox and, and other practicing Jews do? They come here as if this were, this is the closest thing you get to the temple. And so what are, notice, what are they doing at the wall? Praying, and what are they holding? The Hebrew Bible, often the case, and they're reading and chanting, and many of them are rocking as they chant. So here's where they bring the text to the place. And so the text informs the place, and the place informs the text. And you'll notice that some are wearing little boxes on their foreheads. You see that? Here? Yeah. Remember what those are called? Phylacteries. And what's in the, it's a little box, you, it, it's to obey the Deuteronomic commandment, and you shall wear the, you, the word upon your heart. And so they bind themselves, and there's some mention, the Pharisees do this in the Gospels, and so practicing Jews at the wall will do this today. So what they're wearing there is the scripture on their head, and on their, on, on their arms, and then the prayer shawl. So you see various kinds of religious devotion here. You also see the separation of men and women. You see that? This is a wider view. So here you see the western wall. It continues. This was excavated in the 50s. This even had been covered up. And so this is a destination. Do Christians come here and pray as well? Yeah. So, and you see Muslims too. There's much more religious interaction in places like this than you might expect. And then they write uh, words on scraps of paper or prayers. 
and insert them into the cracks, the crevices behind the rocks. You can do the same thing at Mayo. Did you know this? <laughs> the, the Center for the Spirits in the lower level of the Gonda building. There's a little rack where you can put your prayers, write them, and, and it was inspired by this. I know Ruth was part of the design team that put this together, right? And, and then the sisters of St. Francis collect them weekly. They don't read them, they just collect them and they pray over the prayers. They pray for the prayers. So, what's that? You should say more. Well, there's usually over 100 a week. They put them in a basket. A general service collects them, brings them up to a CC, gets them there, and in a concept that was new to me, they say they, they pray for the prayers, which makes sense, but it's not our typical you know, way of prayer. Okay, why am I bringing this up? This is a way in which the text interacts with the place, and the place interacts with the text. You can also, uh, online, you can put, there's a group, Aish.com, they will put your prayers in the wall for you if you just register online. <laughs> but what, what does this speak to? It, it speaks to, we have this desire to have a physical connection with a place. Uh, does it prove the Bible true? No, it doesn't do that. Does it inform our reading of the Bible? Does Jesus talk about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem? And remember, the Gospels, when they were written, there was no Jerusalem anymore. Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 AD. The Gospel, as I think Byrne mentioned today, Matthew, it's got written in the 80s. The temple had been gone for 10 years. So when the Gospel writers write about the temple, there is no temple. And at that point, where does the temple exist? In the text. So the temple's destroyed, but it lives on in the text. Okay. Um, either this is a bar mitzvah or a wedding. Whatever it is, how do the people look? Happy. Yeah, they are very celebrative. Thank you. Just a little more of that. And so there, those are the prayers wedged into the crevices between the rocks. I just think it's it's interesting. Now we'll get through this. The Dome of the Rock. Again, this is a view probably from the uh, tower of a Lutheran church in the middle of Jerusalem. But that could, Bruce will talk about that next time. This is the approximate place of the temple. But it's also holy to Muslims because it's connected with the story of, of Muhammad and his night journey where he takes off from here. And this is the place also in tradition associated with the sacrifice of Isaac. So what happens, here's a place that has all these stories transposed on it. Abraham and Isaac, Muhammad, Jesus, all keep coming to this place. When was that? I think this is 9th century. So this would be well into, uh, uh, I think just before the first crusade. It was turned into a church during the crusades. And it got turned back into a mosque. So it's quite an old building, but what is, is it beautiful? Yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. I was in it on my first trip to Israel in 2000. It's closed to tourists now. But it's covered, yeah it is. Yeah, you've been there. Yep, times change. Okay, this is the streets of modern day Jerusalem, but let me point out what this is here. This is the Armenian Catholic Patriarchate, third station. Everybody know what that would refer to? The Stations of the Cross, which is a a collection of sites that uh, stops on the road, on the paths of Jerusalem, where you mark the progress of Jesus from his, uh, from the palace where he is sentenced to death to where he proceeds to Calvary or to, you know, Golgotha. This is a Franciscan creation. 
the Stations of the Cross are the story of Jesus transposed onto the modern Jerusalem, and the Franciscans have, in the 19th century created this. So this isn't an ancient tradition. I just thought I'd throw that in. What does it enable people to do? It's a way you take the text of the story, and you can give it distance and walk it out. And everybody know Catholic churches, what do they have on the walls often? Stations of the Cross. And, and so what does that enable? Does that mean you have to go to Jerusalem to make a pilgrimage? You can make your pilgrimage along the walls of the church. Now, is that a good thing? I, except for Veronica. That's out of the Bible. I'll explain later. But, but notice that interplay between the text and images and physically moving in space as you make progression from one event to the other. So if you look carefully, you'll see these marked. Notice it kind of almost blends into the, you have to look for them. But you follow, and then you see groups going from one to the other. Is the, uh, uh, the actual street that Jesus walked No. About 20 feet under? It, the actual street Jesus walked would be 20 feet under. <laughs> That's what you have to keep in mind. This is not the Jerusalem of Jesus. This is a medieval, Turkish reconstruction of Jerusalem. It's still cool. What? What did they fill it in with? Rubble. They knock down the buildings and build on top. So everything, you dig down, it's about 22 feet. So it's a, what you have in ancient cities in the Middle East are destruction layers. And built, cities would be built on hills and then invading armies would come and level the city and build a new city on top of it. And that's what the Romans did. What's that? They're hauling stuff. Yeah, stone. That's what slaves are for. It's kind of like the uh, underground city in Seattle. Okay, I don't know the underground city in Seattle. There's another name for that. Underground city. <laughs> there are sections of the city of Seattle that are built on the top. Right. And the street level is about two streets up. Yeah. From so we tend to build cities over cities. And this was the fact in the ancient world, and you'll see this as you, there's something called a tell, which is where you build a city on top of a city. And you might have 30 layers over 5,000 years. Can you imagine? And so you take a slice down that, and then that's where you discover the city. So Jerusalem of Jesus is buried. And what's the problem? It'd be nice to uncover it all, but what's the problem? <laughs> there are people living there. Out, someone comes and knocks on your door. We've heard that your neighborhood in Rochester covers an ancient, uh, you know, uh, pre-Rochester civilization. Mind if we dig up your yard? I got to keep moving. Okay, moving right along. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre. <laughs> This probably dates to the 4th or 5th century. This is one of the older, so this would date to the time of Constantine. And, um, uh, and it was Constantine's mother in the 4th yeah, the fourth century CE who went looking to find holy places for pilgrims. Even in the 4th century, people would make pilgrimage trips. They had done that in the uh, Greek world. They had traveled to cities like Ephesus to what temple was in Ephesus, Ruth? Artemis. Artemis, the temple of Artemis. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Does it exist today? No. Did, what, was it a huge play, destination for religious travelers in the second century BC? Yes. And that continued, can you imagine? And they didn't have frequent flyer miles or anything. Um, yeah, Jim. So, so you know, I mean, St. Helena goes there. Yeah. His mother, and she has this revelation. This is where she's prepared. But well, there's all kinds of like political things going on. And, uh, I mean, it seems to me like you know, a lot of these places that you're going are you're going to places where tradition is right. happening, not necessarily where something happens. That's right. And this is part of the, the challenge. You have to choose uh, do you need the authentic site to validate the story? And the fact is, there is no authentic validation of the place. Helena, she wasn't saint, she becomes a saint a little later, but 
Yeah. You're right. St. Helena, the mother of uh, uh, Constantine, goes and talks to the locals and say, what places do you reference? And so she's relying not on archaeological evidence, but on stories, local, local stories. This building covers two things. It covers, on the one end, what was thought to be the tomb where Jesus was laid, and on the other end, what was Calvary. And all it has, where he was crucified, all under one huge roof. They've carved it all away. Is there any way of actually discovering anymore what happened? Uh, this is a, I'm sorry, I don't have a good picture here, a space called the Edicule, which covers what is thought to have been the tomb of Jesus. If there was a hill here, what's happened to the hill? It's all gone. They, they carved everything out and built a church over it. And uh, it's home to several Orthodox and Catholic traditions, and they all fight over who owns this space. But where is the story of the resurrection of Jesus? Is it re resident in this location? No, it's in the text. It's in the story. Does Paul go here? No. So, is this a good place to visit? Yeah. But how? Do, the question is, how does this relate to your reading of the story? And uh, does this prove the resurrection? Jumping ahead. Um, I'm sorry, I'm moving along here. So you, uh, these are Armenian monks who are reading scriptures. So what do you find located in these places? Lots of reading of scriptures. And so the interaction between the physical place and the text is always part of it. And you can tell the different religions by the hats they wear. We need Lutheran hats. We don't need really <laughs> Get with horns and... <laughs> now, yeah, with horns. Okay, in the 19th century, there was a British general named Lord Gordon uh, who found a different place for the tomb. And this is called Gordon's Calvary. He thought this was more like a garden. And he didn't like <laughs> Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> he was Anglican. And so if you go to, here's the problem, you go to Jerusalem now, you have two choices for the tomb. You can go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and hang out with the Orthodox and the Catholics, or you can go here and hang out with the white evangelical Protestants. I'm not joking. Burn. When my dad was uh, went to Israel maybe 35 years ago, the tour guide was just a little shady, but he, my dad came back with pictures of this and said, "This is the actual place." Yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally, I mean, you, you, so, so many pilgrims need to believe it's the actual place. Yeah. I really like the point about we find it in the text because there are no actual places. There are no actual places. <laughs> Yeah. And my, dad didn't really want to listen, my dad didn't want to listen to his son, who was making that point. I'm <laughs> <laughs> sure he listened to you, Phil. <laughs> there are no actual places. Uh, we had a wonderful guy, by the way, who was an Armenian. Uh, uh, he had trained to be an Armenian priest, but never finished his training. And he was born in Jerusalem. And he was very well schooled. And he had a good critical distance on all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so we were, the guy, he didn't say things that would make you say no. Uh, he, he was very credible and, and had a critical distance, which makes a difference. And he knew the text. So in a sense, you have the text with you, right? And so the, you have it. I'm going to keep moving here. And that is the actual stone. <laughs> No, it's smooth, yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it rolls. <laughs> uh, so what does this say? It, it, it speaks to the need for some people to have their imagination satisfied by concrete objects, which validate the text. Do I think Jesus was crucified, buried, and raised in this vicinity? Yeah, I do. Am I going to locate the right place? Probably not. Oh, 
Moving on. Uh, this is left to your imagination. Uh, you, you can project whatever Rorschach images you want. My bad. Okay. There are things you see which are not in the Bible, but were there during biblical times. And this is one of those interesting things. This is... What's the name of this again, Ruth? Masada. No, it's not Masada. It's, this is the Herodium. This is right outside of Bethlehem. It is an artificial hill that was raised to double its size. And it was the tomb that Herod the Great built for himself. This is right outside of Bethlehem. Is it ever mentioned in the Bible? No, except where Jesus says about moving mountains. This might have been the mountain that was moved because they shaved off one hill and built it up on another. So this is a huge artificial hill that stands outside of Bethlehem. This is where Herod the Great had himself buried. You've been there. So this is not in the biblical, it's not in the Bible, but is it in the Bible? It is. Would this have been on the horizon in the time of Jesus? Yes. Would it have been on the horizon even after the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Yes. So what does it bear witness to? It bears witness to the political authority. And, and Herod was a client king to the Romans, and it represents both his creative building power and the destructive force of politics in the time of Jesus. Uh, this is a sign there were rolling stones from the time of the Jewish revolts against the Romans. And I looked at a pic, I was going to get a picture of Mick Jagger, and I thought, he would probably come from this era. Those stones were rolled down the hill. And we're, we had a good friend, Jim Davis, who took a lot of these pictures for us, and Carl took a few as well. Uh, so this became, uh, this is a reminder of the Jewish revolt in 70 A.D against the Romans, which led to the destruction of Jerusalem, and then I'm not going to get to Masada, but all that is, the Jewish revolt is not in the Bible, but it, does it shape the writers of the biblical text? It does. It does. Most of the New Testament is written after the Jewish revolt in 70 AD. <clears throat> they don't say it, but that, that testimony is there. So this is from the top of the Herodium. And if you look here, there's the Mount of Olives. So are we far outside of Jerusalem here? No. No. It's kind of like that point on Highway 52 where you can see the refinery as you come up. You know what I'm talking about? You're about nine miles out. I drive a lot and I measure the distance. But so here, from the top of this hill, you can see Jerusalem. And can you see this from, from the Mount of Olives? You can. A couple more places. So let's go to <laughs> the other place on the seacoast I mentioned was Caesarea Maritima. This is mentioned in the book of Acts. This is where Felix and Justice are. And this is where Paul is held prisoner before taking, being taken to Rome. And this is where Pontius Pilate likely resided. So does it appear in the Gospels? It doesn't. Does it appear in the book of Acts? It does. Uh, you named your town after Caesar. That's where the Caesarea comes from. It's kind of like, we want to get on good terms with the Caesar, so what do we name? Let's name our town after Caesar. Um, Caesar only existed in the Bible until about 50 years ago when they discovered, or 60 years ago, they discovered this stone. And what's carved on that stone? Tiberium, and then Ius Pilatus. What do you think was written here? It's been scratched out. Pontius. This is a replica, but, but the, what is that evidence? Rarely do we find, there had been no historical evidence for Pontius Pilate. Where did he exist in the text? So what was this? This was an inscription from the period. Does it prove there was a pilot? Well, it, it's a strong indicator. So what I what I did here, I just 
made out these letters and put them here. Eus, there's no U in Latin. They just had a V. And so this is the uh, the seaside palace where that stood of the Roman rulers like Pontius Pilate. This was the sign of Roman power. Did Pontius Pilate live in Jerusalem? No. Where, where would you live? At a seaside resort or in Jerusalem? I go for the seaside resort. Does it snow in Jerusalem? Yes. I was there once in January and it snowed 12 inches. Wow, that's right. Do they have a good way of handling snow in Jerusalem? No. Okay, this is that group again. But we'll uh, and let's go to another Caesarea. <coughs> this occurs in the uh, so Caesarea Maritima means it's on the on the lake shore. Caesarea Philippi is that town in the north where in the Gospel of Mark it says Jesus and his disciples were on their way to Caesarea Philippi and they asked Jesus. And Jesus turned to his disciples and said, Who do men or who do people say that I am? So Caesarea Philippi. I had no idea what that would be like. Or why it's mentioned. When Luke tells the same story and, and copies Mark's version, he erases the name of the town Caesarea Philippi and just says when Jesus was at prayer. Why would Luke do that? Because he probably didn't know where Caesarea Philippi was either. And he didn't care. But what would that have meant, in, in, and this is where I learned something, what Caesarea Philippi was. It is a worship destination for Roman pagan deities. The Temple of Pan. And these were all shrines along the walls. So if Jesus was on the right way to Caesarea Philippi, what was he heading to? A center of Roman pagan worship. There was no synagogue here. And the and the Nile source or Nile source, pardon me. The source of the Jordan is just on the hills above this. So the question is why would Jesus go here? This is traveling outside of Jewish territory. And that had never hit me before, how the territory changes when it says Jesus traveled here. And this is a McDonald's that dates back. So what do we, this uh, represents what? American cultural occupation. And uh, you can't, in a kosher McDonald's, you cannot get a cheeseburger. <laughs> Read the book of Exodus and you'll find out why. You can't mix meat and dairy. Oh, see, the cultural... So you need the Bible to understand McDonald's <laughs> in Israel. And uh, we're, wrapped, we're almost done here. The Sea of Galilee. Does that appear often in the New Testament? Jesus, a lot of his work on the Galilee is in the northwest quadrant of the Sea of Galilee, which is a freshwater lake, uh, Capernaum. So here's the Sea of Galilee. It's about 14 miles across, 30 miles long. I'm not sure what to compare it to. It's bigger than Lake Mille Lacs. What's that? I don't know. I've never been to Tahoe. Maybe it's of that scale. But there was a fishing industry there. And, and so you get there and you realize how many stories are told on this water or by the water side. And this is 80 miles from Jerusalem. So you realize you're culturally remote from Jesus' ultimate destination. But this is where he recruits his group from this kind of marginal Jewish area. Moving right along, and you get boat rides, and then okay, this is a restaurant. 
St. Peter's restaurant. <laughs> It, it, it kind of looks like it dates back to the time of Peter. Uh, part of the tourist experience is eating St. Peter's fish, which is really a kind of tilapia. But they do it up well in mass. And, and so here's where food interacts with the biblical experience. How often do we read biblical stories where they eat? And the eating of fish is part of it. And so this is where you can kind of engage the story with your own appetites. And it was pretty good fish. Yeah, Ruth. Oh, the land of milk and honey. Have you heard that phrase? <laughs> um, our guy explained it to us. It is, it, land of milk and honey refers to two different kinds of territory. And you see this as you travel north to south in Israel. The Galilee region is verdant. It's green. And the Judean area, Jerusalem and south, is dry and arid. In the green area, where plants grow, you have bees. And what do bees produce? Honey. But in the dry area, you have goats. And what do goats produce? Milk. So milk and honey isn't the same place. It's two different kinds of places. The north would be the land of honey, and the south would be the land of milk. And so that little phrase... And, and as you travel north to south in Israel, it's from Galilee to Jerusalem is about 90 miles. But you travel from one ecological region to a one that's very different. And so milk and honey then describes the land. I better go to the very end here. We're running out of time. Camels, what is... Um, just a minute. These are goats and sheep. And so we stopped the bus and I read Matthew 25 and we separated sheep from goats here. <laughs> no, that's a joke. Um, I'm going to end here at, in the Jordan at the baptismal site for Jesus. The Gospel of John says Jesus was baptized at Bethany beyond the Jordan. That's on the east side of the Jordan. Most of the tourists go to the west side, the official Israeli baptismal sites. This is a, thought to be the more ancient site. Again, is it the actual site, Jim? I don't know. But does it, does it fit more with the biblical description? It does. And so if you're trying to imagine where Jesus might have been baptized, it would have been in this marsh, swamp land, the wilderness where John the Baptist was. Is it remote? Yes. And it gives you some notion that people go from the urban setting, which is about 15 miles away, to this place of disruption. And in a way, uh, difficulty. And the, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of uh, Jordan and the Holy Land, with the support of the Lutheran World Federation, has built a chapel at the site, and with the courtesy of the government of, uh, the, uh, of the Kingdom of Jordan. So this is part of our Lutheran presence there at the baptismal site. I just want you to know, I hadn't known about this, but it was really meaningful to go to this place and to think that the Lutheran Church has supported. There are a number of church organizations represented in different chapels. Ruth, did you have anything to add here? It was hot and sweaty, it's though. Very it's very newly opened. Uh, and this is crossing, looking across the Jordan, and you see people lined up in robes getting baptized. Uh, you can also buy bottles of Jordan, Jordan water and bring it home. They're not potable, but you use them for baptism. I've got several if you need any. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we do stuff like that? It's kind of a physical reminder. Does the water actually have any magic to it? No, just rest assured, it doesn't. It just glows in the dark. <laughs> and I want to end, I realize we're overdue, Mount Nebo. I talked about Moses. 
in Deuteronomy, Moses climbed Mount Nebo. There the Lord showed him the whole land, and the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. Until today. And then Martin Luther King, the night before he was shot, we don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I have been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind, like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. I'm not concerned with it now, but I want to do God's will. He allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. Have you heard this text? Read? It's online. What story was Martin Luther King referring to here? Moses has Moses been an important figure in American history? For the European colonists, they saw themselves as a chosen people coming to a promised land. Harriet Tubman, Tubman the conductor on the Underground Railroad, was regarded as a, a Moses, an African-American Moses. Martin Luther King, I mean, this is such a scary, prescient speech. But I, did his audience know what he was talking about? Yes. They knew that story. Did he have to tell them I'm reading from Deuteronomy 34? He did not, because this has been a story and a vision part of the black church for a very long time. And I just want to say, what did he do? He took, uh, we went to the mountaintop. One last shot here. This is the view from Mount Nebo, looking down to the Jordan. And what can you see? Jericho, the Jordan River Valley, and you can see the edges of the city of Jerusalem. So is it an incredible sight? You have to, it's something to go there and read the text, because we went to the mountaintop and I read Deuteronomy 34. And I read the story of Martin Luther King Jr. But do we have to go there to have a vision? I don't think so. As Vern talked about this morning, about moments, this was a moment for me to get, and I looked and I saw, wow, this is really a sight. But do we all have moments and places where the biblical text, we can stand on top of a mountain with that text of our own and have a vision? I think so. So I'll end here. Yeah, Vern or Ruth? Shortly after we got home from this, we had the television on, and there was a there was a conference of African American churches, and they watched somebody go up to the uh, kind of the podium to speak, and on the front of it said, "Malcolm," <laughs> and that just kind of another you know the carrying forth that has incredible significance. And they don't know. There, there are a lot of Black Baptist churches named Mount Nebo or Mount Pisgah, which is the neighboring church. Anyway, I, I just wanted to give some examples of how the text interacts with the experience of visiting and how also the text has shaped the way we see the land here. I don't know, I didn't, there was too much to cover and I went too quickly. Um, but I better stop here because church is starting and I wouldn't want to step on that. <laughs> and and uh, uh, I don't know if it's next week, but Sue and Ruth will talk about the contemporary issues and kind of bring it home uh, to where we are today. But thank you for coming this morning.